Hello and welcome. As you know, I am the Crusader Gal, and thank you for joining me tonight. I have a special guest. Her name is Denise McAllister. She's been on the show before. She's the author of What Men Want to Say to Women But Can't. She once wrote prolifically in conservative circles, especially around the topic of the family unit and healthy Christian relationships. She famously condemned uh, homosexual so-called marriages at great personal cost. Nowadays, she does beltoftruthmagazine.com. And most importantly, she's a dear friend of mine. So welcome back to the show, Denise. Oh, thank you for having me. It is great to be here. And it's always great to talk with you. You are a shining light in a beacon. You're a beacon in a shining circle of darkness. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I, I do try. and I'm aware of just how bad conservative ink is. So it's kind of easy to sort of elevate above that a bit. Um, but I brought you on today because one of the sort of biggest news items in our orbit is the fact that Dave Rubin, who is often presented as being a conservative political commentator, and his gay husband, and I realize the husband is kind of a dubious term here, are about to have children. And there are different ways I can say have children because we're talking about IVF, we're talking about surrogacy, obviously two men can't have a child uh, in the normal way. This is something that on Twitter you you referred to as an abomination recently. I'm happy to stand beside you on that, but I don't want to ever invite a guest on the show and put words into her mouth. So why don't you go ahead and tell us why it is that you would consider that to be an abomination? Well, let me first start, of course, by saying I am not calling Dave Rubin himself as a human being an abomination or his sure. husband or his children that are going to be born. Um, and what is an abomination is what God calls an abomination is a twisting of God's design of the created order for human relationships, human procreation, um, mothers and fathers and families. So that's what I'm commenting on. I think it, and it's a social issue. It's something that we need to comment on, not only because he's the one who made it public and declared it to everybody with many, many people in conservative media supporting him and giving him a shout out and congratulating him as if this is a good thing. So, I mean, the commentary is valid as it's in the public sphere, but also discussions about family, which is the foundational unit of society, is um, very much of public interest. I mean, it's why we have family court. It's why we have marriage laws. Even if you don't believe that this, the state should be giving out marriage licenses, I think we all agree that the state should be involved in divorce cases, child custody, um, holding parents responsible, protecting children, this kind of thing. So um, it's very much relevant. And also understanding the very nature of humanity, you know, what it means to be human and what it means to have relationships that build the fabric of society and the foundation on which we all stand. Right. So first of all that, but secondly, uh, I also wanted to point out that, you know, this is an issue that does have a bearing on everything that we do and everything that we uh, vote for politically. It's culturally relevant as well as politically relevant um, as we learned from the marriage um, ruling that right. it has, it has an impact on society. So the first thing, why do I think that this is an abomination? Why do I think this is wrong? Why do I think this is very, very bad for society? The main reason is that the individual, who we are, our human nature, is designed by a creator. We have an identity that he has given us, and our rights and our freedoms and our liberties are very much tied to that identity. It's intrinsically yes. tied to that identity. We have rights because we're human beings made in the image of God. We have liberties because they come from God. Now, when you start having man make up his own identity the way he wants it to be, or rewriting the very essence of what human nature is, or saying that human beings are whatever we want to be and however we want to um, you know, create life to sustain mm -hmm. society, when that happens, then you know, you're getting away from God's design. And there's consequences for that. So here we have a man who's, I don't think he claims to be conservative. I think he claims now to be libertarian. He has claimed at least once to be conservative. And I know that a lot of people present him as it, but he's someone who I don't think anyone could refer to as conservative in the sense that, I mean, what are you conserving, right? I mean, in the modern sense, it's like, if you're not on the, on the 
far left fringes of society, then you're somehow conservative. If you care about freedoms in any sense, then you're conservative. We have this sort of mismatch of terminology, and that's the problem. Like, why I no longer like, use the term conservative to self-describe because it's like, I don't want people thinking that I'm Dave Rubin. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, it, that's the kind of issue. Well, we've lost sight about what, what, like you said, what are we conserving? I mean, what are conservatives? What are they conserving? Just fighting for liberty in general, political liberty, is in the realm of classical liberalism and libertarianism. That's not just part of conservatism. Conservatism is very specific, uh, and it's about conserving the family unit. Now, even within conservatism, you have people who are more wanting the state to be involved in conserving those things and others who are like it's not so much about the state conserving it but society itself i'm I'm more like that i don't want the state imposing anything well some things they need to impose but mostly i want the culture and the, and the individual to, to exercise self-government yes which is the foundation of, of liberty so uh when you come well, you don't have to... well you don't have a decent government anyway if you don't have a decent culture and that descends from the individual and from from the family unit right i mean you get all, i mean i think some people and i know this isn't you but some people get this idea that you can have like a, a a perfect government without a society that has created that government like without a a cultural force that has that has insisted on certain moral underpinnings and i don't think that's ever been the case or could possibly be well, that's why John Adams said our Constitution is made for a religious and moral people. Yes. Didn't mean by that that we need to use the Constitution to impose morality and religion onto people. Right. He was saying that it, that um, the Constitution, liberty and right governance, comes out of people who are self-governed in morality, and that's you know of course comes out of religious faith. So Dave Rubin has announced on his YouTube, and he went into a great detail about the creation of his family. He called it his fertility journey with the, his partner, um, who is a man. And, you know, he's like, it even sounds kind of weird to him, but everything, everyone seems to be really cool with it. And he, and he explains how this happened. And he said, it cost a lot of money, which it does. So we have uh, really wealthy people basically buying and selling the creation of human beings. I mean, we can't sell our, uh, we can't sell my, our organs. I can't sell bodily tissue. Uh, you know, because Congress deemed it you know, that they would Unethical. give an unfair advantage to the wealthy. Mm -hmm. So yet, yet we can sell our reproductive tissue. We can sell our eggs and our sperm to make other people and have them disconnected from the very foundation of who they have a biological connection with about their own self identity. We can do this, and Dave Rubin did it. So he went. They went to an egg bank. I guess they're out there, and they picked out eggs from a woman. I'm not clear whether they know the woman. I think those are anonymous. I think egg banks like sperm banks are anonymous. So they bought the eggs. Uh, they don't know. They have a, a sheet about the woman. I guess they went and picked out the ideal yeah. woman from the eggs. Right. They from paid, a, just a list, list of different, you know, really shallow characteristics. Yep. Yeah, which is this whole thing is very creepy. When he was talking yes. about it, it was very creepy. I, I I was horrified by his communication. It wasn't about I didn't hear him mention love and no. That's that's the thing. It's like just how incredibly dehumanizing this entire process is and it has to be, because I think that when you insert the human element, the fact that you're talking about the creation of a human life, it becomes very disturbing to anyone who listens to it. And even anyone who says it. So I think that even when Dave Rubin is describing a process that he himself went through, he's forced into a into a position of dehumanizing the entire process, you know, because otherwise it's really horrifying to think and to say in in human terms, well, we rented this womb, right? We rented these eggs. We threw away some embryos, right, which were you know, had the potential to be, which were people, right? Which, which was human life. We just kind of threw those away. We chose on the basis of just shallow characteristics, um, who we should use and exploit. Um, I mean, there's, there's so much wrong with the picture, and then we are planning on taking a child away from its mother for mm -hmm. life, right, and denying that child the, the right of a family, of a healthy family unit. And it's like when you pile it all on top of each other, I think it should make all of us sit back a little. Yeah, it should. You know, and so when you're buying eggs and they're purchased, yes, uh, you know, and, and it's interesting how at every step the woman is marginalized. The woman is is depersoned, and the the woman who should be the who's the mother, the mother, yes, removed because of a couple of wealthy guys who want some babies um, can pay to have the mother removed, and then they're creating a human being um, in in that void. 
So, uh, so they they buy these eggs, and then they go and find two surrogates because the, each wants to implant an eggs so that each of the men both have a child with their genes. Right. So they have the same eggs from the same mom, and then they're each getting a pile and, and implanting um, and fertilizing those eggs. And then once those are fertilized, and like you said, some of them are viable, but they're tossed aside. So yeah. living beings have now been killed in this process. Yeah. And, you know, persons that have been created by God, when those eggs, you know, when the egg and the sperm come together, the DNA forms, you have human life. Is it fully developed human life? No, it's not. But we're right back to the abortion debate, right? Where, where does personhood begin? But it begins at fertilization, you know, and conception. So you have, um, you know, have this new life, many lives in this process who are now destroyed. A mother, uh, the mother who had the eggs is gone. That relationship's been destroyed. The entire thing is a, a culture of, of death in a lot of ways. Yes. So you have, um, so they pick out the eggs and then they've picked out two women to carry the babies because they want the babies to be born at the same time. Right. So they've manufactured that. It is so brave new world. It, it just really is and just Disturbing. I know. I mean, you might as well have see, see the the dripping going along as the as the fertilization goes yeah. along in the different rows. Um, where is John Savage? <laughs> uh, just um, the, so they pick out these women. So they hire two two women to be surrogates, yeah. who he describes as really lovely ladies. And so um, I don't like I said they're separate. They're renting. They're, that's womb rental. Yes. They're not contributing any DNA. They're renting the wombs. And um, then they implanted the eggs after they fertilized them individually into these women. And then these children will be born, um, not having any relation to the surrogate, which is the least of the issues right now because of there's no genetic, there's no contribution. They're an incubator, a living incubator, which has its own problems. Oh, I'm yes. not saying the right thing. It has its own problems, especially with an industry of surrogacy, and it's a horrible industry of abuse and exploitation. But the, as far as the eggs and the real mother and the genetic um, components, they won't know this mother. They won't have a mother. Yep. They have two men raising them. And I'm sorry, but a man does not replace a mother. A father is a father and a mother is a mother. A woman is a woman and a man is a man. And a child is born of the genetic components of, t of a man and a woman, and that's their mother and father. And these two men, because they're wealthy, have now eradicated that relationship on purpose and put children into a position where they are purposely by these two adult men, taking away a core relationship that develops the identity, the self-identity and the psychological health of these children. So children, um, there's a site called Anonymous Us that mm -hmm. talks about this, these children born like this where they are raised not knowing who they are truly. Um, they don't have that organic, they can't even fill out a proper, proper medical Well, form. They, they denied their intrinsic dignity right because yeah. they were bored they were bought and paid for commodities and, and constructed you know right. and with, with with the sacrifice of their brothers and sisters who were killed you know so they could yes. be they could live you know and so um this is the process that was going through and so this I, the identity of these children they're robbed of the psychological benefits i mean we have so much literature i don't even need to prove it of the need for a biological and a um, biological mother and a biological father in the health and welfare of children. Uh, they need it for their spiritual health, their physical health, their psychological health, their emotional health to purposely, purposely take a mother out of that scenario is neglect. It's neglect by the woman who sold her eggs. Mm -hmm. And it, and I hear a lot of people say, well, they freely chose this. A woman freely chose this. Well, the consent. children didn't. Yeah, the children didn't, and and con the consent, consent to do something that harms others, consent between two parties that's going to harm a third party. You don't have the right to do that in our society. You shouldn't have the right to do that in our society. And in family law, you don't have the right to do that. In family law, you can't just disappear as a parent without consequences. Right, you know? and and even if, if if the mother and the father in in a in a regular arrangement. Um, decide to be neglectful to their children. We don't say, well, the parents consented, therefore the children have to suffer, um, you know, the the outcome of that decision. That doesn't make any sense. But we've kind of emerged at this sort of society where we say, well, if the if the parties involved consent, then everything's fine, because we, and, and we do that at the expense of that family, right? Because we we've arrived at a point, I think, 
Now, we're unwilling to say what is right and what is wrong in clear terms because, you know, that sounds a bit too judgy. And, and for that reason, for our, our inability to say this, this is what's good and right and just, um, because of that, we end up in a situation where we're, where we're harming people, we're harming children, and putting it under the veil of, well, everyone consents, so it's fine. It's like, no, that there are real costs to the most innocent of our society. And that's what we're talking about in this Rubin case. And in every case like it, of course, like, you know, there are uh, leftist gay commentators who've done this very same thing, who have received more outrage from the right uh, because it was more uh, politically easier, I guess, uh, for them to, for them to criticize it in that case. But in this case, you have to, you know, speak against the so-called friend, right? Mm -hmm. That's the issue here. But they don't have a problem firing a so-called friend when she speaks the truth to someone about their homosexuality. So it really depends on the power of the friend, doesn't it? I'm just not wealthy enough and powerful enough, I don't think. I, I need to have more more followers like Dave Rubin, have more power, have more money, and be part of the guys club. That you know, is true. That, and, and for anybody who wants to know your story and how you got kicked out of Conservative Inc. for, for, for being honest um, <laughs> about a, a homosexual marriage, we do have another video, and I will link to that in the description of this one. Because we, I mean, we had you on before, and we talked about that in great detail, uh, yeah. which was a really good show. Thank you. But yeah, it, it is, you know, we get um, too sidetracked and too compromised when we're emotionally involved and, and friends with people, you know, and that's just human nature. It happens. But you have to be guarded in that, especially if you're in media and if you're a political commentator claiming to stand for truth in society, you have to watch your relationships. You have to be, you know, am I doing this because I want to keep my friend and I want to be invited to all the really nice cocktail parties, you know, or am I doing it because it's the right thing? And I, and, and Conservative media is very incestuous and very dependent on each other. It is like the the yeah, club, a, a clique in high school. It really, really much is. But that's a whole different story. Um, back to uh, what's being done to these poor children. So, you know, you have these adults who have consented. You have a mother who's consented to neglect her child, right. who to toss her to the wind, basically. And you, and you can say it's just the eggs, but there's there's consequences. You're you're selling it for a purpose. So you have you have to connect the dots. Yes. You know, you know, there's um, you know, law is never isolated unto itself. You look at consequences and actions as they go together. You're selling your eggs for a child to be created and that's your child and you're choosing not to raise that child. And you're selling you know, at least half of that child, if you want to put it that way, mm -hmm. to people and, and to men. And there were the surrogates and, as well. And then there's the surrogates, you're paying them. And so you're selling them. And then you have, uh, you know, then they're being raised. They're being raised, like I said, without even knowledge of part of their family. They don't have an understanding of, you know, the intimacy and the value of being raised, uh, you know, with a mother. Motherhood has been negated in this situation, has been tossed aside. And like I said, I'm sorry, but, you know, your gay partner does not m a mother make. Uh, he's still a dude. He's still a guy. And two fathers is not what little Johnny needs or little Sally. They need a mom and a dad. They need their mom and their dad. That's optimal. That's what we owe children in society. And, and to dump our our pathologies, our needs, and our, our desires for normalcy or for relational intimacy that we have abandoned because of our own choices. These two men wanted a family, but they made choices that negated that. They, they in essence, made themselves consensually sterile. Yes. And so um, by their relationship, they chose that. You know, but yet they don't want to live with the consequences of their choices. Instead, they want to harm a child. And it is real harm. Uh, child abuse laws, by definition, child abuse slash neglect are a, an adult, a parent um, doing anything either on purpose or not on purpose to bring emotional or physical harm to children. Now, you are purposely, Dave Rubin, bringing emotional harm to a child, to two children. Yes. And for, you know, for very selfish reasons, right? For I, very selfish I mean, that's what really, the very, very, the very first decision he made to be a parent was to sort of sacrifice the, those children in a sense, you know, by, by making this decision to bring them into a home that was not a family. And so he, this, this very initial decision was incredibly selfish um, on, on his part. And of course, not specifically him, but also anybody who makes this same decision that he's making. And, you know, Single women. go ahead. Single women do it. 
with sperm donors, single women do it a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, they single straight women go in and do this, leave out fathers. I mean, the same conversation that we're having right now about the mothers can be had about fathers in the context of sperm sales. So uh, it happens all the time and it's evil. It's harmful to children. It's creating disconnection. And I know you will meet people and I've met them and I've talked to them, but I've met both sperm donor kids and a donor, Mm -hmm. they're they're sold, sperm sold kids, sold kids and, um, and circuit kids who don't know one of their parents and yeah, you know, I've talked and talked to them. They, they want to know that they that, that part's missing. They, of course, they are in a horrible situation like adoptees. Um, they don't want to speak badly about the person that raised them yes. or the people that raised them. They love them, and they, they were raised in a relationship where that love was fostered in that way. But one thing we need to understand, and one of the lies of our culture, is human love that's in the context of doing something wrong does not cover over a multitude of sins. You know, you can ha- you can love someone within a, a terrible sin ridden context oh, sure. and still be wrong and harmful. And you still need to do the right thing despite your feelings and attachments to this person. And I would say that there's real love on the part of those children um, for those pe- people who raise them. But I do question it's going to sound really harsh and horribly judgmental of me, but I don't care, um, is that I don't think you're actually the adults are being very loving to children. And you know, choosing to bring children in by selfishly and purposely robbing them of something, a relationship that is going to cause them emotional harm, yeah. continuing that lie and continuing that neglect throughout their entire life does not make a good parent. And I've heard even conservatives and I've heard conservatives who have even expressed their disagreement with this say, oh, I'm sure Dave and his partner, whatever his name is, yeah. will um, be great parents. Well, I don't know. No, right. for two reasons. One, because of what I just said. They're purposely harming a child and they're continuing to do, to do it. And number two, they're raising a child in a sin-ridden home in which a relationship is being t- called normal and healthy and good, and they're lying to their kids. So you cannot live, you know, th- none of this is good for the children. Well, now, does that mean that they're horrible and they're beating, they're not going to be supplying and they're, they're, they're rich, so they're probably going to get a lot of stuff. Um, and, you know, but that it does not make for healthy childhood. It does not make for good parenting. It does not. And, and I will go ahead and, and throw in something that you, you don't have to comment on because I know most people don't want to. But there is a connection between those who are more uh, prone to homosexuality and those who are prone to pedophilia. And nowadays it's something we're not supposed to talk about, um, but I'll do so anyway. And I, I think it's a something that we should pay attention to. And uh, right now it's it's being covered up because we want to say, oh, they're this way from birth, you know, and it's like, well, no. Um, actually, and there is a connection between trauma uh, in childhood and and homosexuality, and so all of that needs to be said. But also, if I can move a little bit, um, those on on the right right now, it's it's actually kind of a hot button issue. They're rightly concerned uh, about sexual deviancy being taught in schools. Um, I think that's that's a good thing. It is something we should be paying attention to. It's important. But what I find kind of ironic is the fact that some of these same people who express that concern are perfectly fine with Dave Rubin uh, bringing these kids into a homosexual home and therefore exposing kids to a sort of sexual deviancy from birth and having that being taught as their as their sort of baseline standard. And I find some kind of disconnect there. It's like, how can you be... How can you have a problem with sexual deviancy and sex being taught uh, to seven and eight year olds, which yes, I have a problem with, but not have a problem with a two, three, four year old having this as their, as their baseline standard of what a family is? And how can you not expect kids who are raised in that to have a, a warped or a distorted view of what a family should be? Well, they will. And of course, the people who would respond to you by saying, well, I don't think the homosexuality is a perversion. I mean, that, that's that's their baseline is they, they've accepted homosexuality as a norm. And and, as a, and not only that, and this what you're bringing up is very important and it actually will expose a whole cauldron of problems. And if I can unpack it for you a little bit, because yep. you've really tapped into <laughs> the sexualization of children, you know, and the abuse of children. Um, that even within, let's say, David Rubin's household, and he and his uh, partner, you know, kept everything on straight and narrow, didn't have any kind of a lot of the perversions that are famously go on in homosexual households. And they do. If you talk to people who've come out of the homosexual environment, yes. they talk about it's 
riddled with abuse. It's real. Uh, oh, anyway, but let's say they're perfect. <laughs> they don't do any of that bad stuff. Um, they are still doing a couple of things wrong. First, they're modeling a very unhealthy sexual relationship and that is contrary again to God's design. And that causes dysfunction in the child. If nothing else, it just causes the child to think that what is not sinful, what is sinful is not sinful. So you're causing spiritual harm um, for the child. But also by saying that sexual, and this is my, what I'm going to say to all you people who've accepted homosexuality as if it's a, 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 a true identity, that it is a, it is a good, it's normal, um, by it's not, you know, it's not God's design. It's not someone's identity. It is a behavior, but because you have now said it is, you have said that someone's identity as a man and as a woman, as a sexual creature is defined by their sexuality, by their sexual choices. So you're saying that this person is a human being, that that is their identity and that the LGBT agenda, they understand this, their whole fight mm -hmm. in culture has not been, been about, Hey, I want to have sex and get your nose out of my bedroom. That is not the fight for the LGBT. So all of you people who are saying, ah, I don't care what people do in their bedrooms, whatever they want, you know, no, no, I don't care. That's not what the LGBT is fighting for. And it's not what they've won, what they want and what they fought for. And what they have won in the culture and in the courts is a recognition that this is my identity as a human being. Right. Okay, follow me here. If that is your identity as a human being and your identity as a human being is determined by your sexual preferences, you know, orientations, choices, whatever, you can say you were born that way, but you're, you're saying you distinguish what they are by your, by your feelings and your choices. And so you're saying that that is your identity. You have now made all human beings that that that's their identity so our, our identity as human beings is determined that's why their rights are attached that's why they demand rights they can't demand rights if they haven't already established that this is my identity as a human being that had to come yes and that was determined in same-sex marriage in obergefell that was already established in law that our identity is determined by our own feelings and therefore that's our identity as a human being and the rights come with it so it, identity and rights, identity is very much a part of this. So if our sexual identity, that's our human identity, then children, right, their identity, we've already established this in law, right? That identity is based on feelings. Right. Let me just put it simply. Identity is based on feelings. Your human identity is based on feelings. We've established that in law and in culture and in our embrace of homosexuality. If that's the case, then children, their identity is intrinsically tied up in their sexual feelings and behaviors. And for them to be recognized as their full identity, the younger, I mean, basically out of the womb, we need to be looking at their identity in terms of their sexuality. That has never been the case in human history. Sexuality is something that you grow into as a man and a woman when you hit puberty, and then you know you learn how to manage that as far as your actions. But you're basically a human being. You know, you're you're a boy or a girl. I mean, definitely physically, but you know, your sexual feelings and impulses and all that come later with development. It's not your identity as a human being, but it is now. Right. So this is why now we're imposing on children calls for more education, identifying little little two year old Johnny's gay or little three year old you know Susie who who wants to be a, you know a guy is now a guy because that determines their sexual identity. Sexuality is very much tied up into children now because it's all about identity. This is sexualizing the children, and it's imposing adult definitions and adult expectations of identity on children. This is perverted. This is again. It, it is perverted. Uh, but I mean, when you when you take homosexuality and you take it and say that this is sort of intrinsic to a person's self and we're we're born this way and that's all there is to it. It's like it's not very difficult to see how how we're slipping toward the normalization of pe pedophilia because it's like we're saying, well, a person has not just like we're no longer willing to say that the heterosexual status is is normal we, we can't say that anymore but instead we're supposed to say that there are multiple different sexual identities and you're all born that way and we know that these things exist simply because people have attractions and on the basis of those sexual attractions you know a, a gay man is attracted to a man um, therefore he, he simply is and always was well then why not pedophilia why is it not the case that a person who is simply attracted to children 
is simply born that way. And if so, we can make exactly the same arguments in favor that we have made for homosexuals. And it's like, there are some people who seem shocked that we're moving, not me and you, but culturally, we're moving toward the acceptance of, of pedophilia as a sexual orientation. And it's like, well, you can make exactly the same arguments that we have made and accepted um, for homosexuality. And people don't seem to see that uh, as clearly as, as I do. And I think you do. Well, I do, especially when it comes to identity, because that's the whole, you know, if, if you are what you feel. Yes. Right. If, if I, if I am who I have sex with, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, if I am what my sexual impulses are, uh, you know, then it doesn't matter on identity and no one can question it. I mean, again, Obergefell already defined that. Obergefell could change the definition of marriage because it could, it changed the definition and identity of what human beings are. Yes. People need to think about that more deeply because let me, there's a step before we get, I think, into, into pedophilia because there's also the, the issue of consent. And of course, that's a big people. They, well, you can feel that way and you can be that way. You just can't mess with kids because kids don't have consent. Yeah. But if you're moving the sexualization of children more about identity and rights and making it younger and younger and younger, you're going to remove you know, adults having to determine whether they have consent or not. You're going to say, well, they do. Yes. We're already doing that with transgenderism, right? Yep. Well, they feel that way, so they should have the right to cut off their genitalia no matter how young. Uh, and again, and, and speaking of transgender, and that's the step I think that we're all going to embrace as a culture more freely, and it's going to happen quickly, and I'd say in the next two to five years, mm -hmm. um, is the full acceptance of transgenderism. And this is also an, a great irony and disconnect that I have with conservatives and even Christians. If you have embraced homosexuality as a normative identity and a real identity, and yet you're fighting against transgenderism, you're at cross purposes with yourself. You've right. already given up the premise. Yes. You've already you've already defeated your own argument. You know, so these people at Daily Wire and wherever, you know, who are all about Dave Rubin and all about, you know, legitimizing gay identity, but are like down with the transgenders and saying, no, you can't do that. That's wrong. No, you've already no, you've already opened it, you, and we've already established in law that they have rights, and, and we should recognize that because because again, identity is based on what now feelings, feelings, yeah. and, and in particular sexual feelings, mm -hmm. and because our because we have become a society consumed with the sexual self, the sexual self, you know, very Freudian. Freudian is so happy. Freud is so happy. This is what he wanted. We are all defined by our sexual self. Yes. We as a society have now embraced that, and, and that is the determinative. I mean, think about it. We all want to know, are you gay or straight? Who are you sleeping with? What are you doing? Are you, you know, it's all about the sex all the time. Well, it seems like you really have to ask for the homosexual to kind of enter the room and lead lead with that. Uh, I've yeah, noticed. Yeah, we see their identity, right? And, they, and again, that's the fight. I'm not, I'm not saying that. That's what the LGBT yes. fight is. Then. And don't be fooled by anything else. It's not about sexual practices. And people like me who are very much opposed to anything LGBT, it doesn't have to do with the sexual practices. I mean, heterosexual people do all kind of gross stuff all the time, too. It's not about that. It's about claiming something as an identity, and that is not an identity. It's, it's twisting and redefining human nature. And that's and so that's very dangerous. It's dangerous for children. We're now sexualizing children. If you we have legally already established in law, and some great lawyer is going to figure it out when it comes to making more um, legalizing the transgender stuff at any age, doing anything, yeah. um, you know, the whole sperm, the stuff that Dave Rubin's doing, redefining family. Some lawyer is going to come in and say, all these cases cases you know need to be supported and the laws need to be passed to support all this because we've already got precedent and have already stated in law that identity is determined by feelings. Right, we already seated the, the sort of foundation. Uh, I agree <laughs> and, and I do think that if people should know of course, I mean there have been multiple different um, cases of us seeding ground and again by us I just mean our, our culture and certainly those on the right who said that they were being conservative whilst they gave, um, whilst they didn't conserve anything. Uh, so, of course, originally there was the point of whether or not uh, homosexuality exists as a sexual orientation in itself equal to heterosexuality. Um, I don't think either of us think that's the case, but our culture sort of accepted it. And then later on, we came to redefine marriage, um, and which, is a, which served as a stepping stone for where we are now with what Ruben is doing. Because, I mean, that was one of the, one of the arguments we made um, back before gay marriage was seen as, as normal, uh, which it is now, as relatively normal or equal, or certainly as legal, um, was, well, as soon as you start saying that they can, they can marry and they have marriage under the law, well, 
they're going to have kids who are going to get kind of pulled into this. And the the gay mafia scream, well, no, of course not. We just we just want equal rights with um, with you guys, and we want. To, to, to join for insurance purposes and tax purposes. And, oh, I remember that. That was their argument, yeah, right? Yeah, you remember that now, right? Yeah, exactly. It never was. I never bought it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. And that was the thing with, well, no, of course not. Of course we wouldn't force a baker to bake a cake, you know? <laughs> the kind of thing. And, and here we are with arguing over over the cakes and arguing over the photographers and those who are making cards for marriages and all of that. But I do, I do think that intrinsically here, the choice to redefine marriage which is what it was, right? It wasn't just, oh, now they can get marriage. No, what we're saying is that for the past, you know, several thousand years, how we've defined marriage is now new. We're just going to change it by Supreme Court edict. And as we do that, we can change the entire dynamic of what a family is as well. Yeah, we've done it. I, I look at, you know, legally and structurally with the redefinition of the family and, and the heterosexual crowd played a role in creating that happening with making no fault divorce and anybody can get me and just devaluing the very nature of what marriage is, um, you know, as a covenant, and as a contract and as a as a union between two people. So that was deteriorated and, and just trashed you know, by uh, people who weren't even thinking about homosexuality and this happened in the straight world yes. so you know we paved the way for that so denigrating the family and making it like well anything goes in a family anything's a family you know a family can be five people or a family can be you know a divorced person remarried 30 times you know with the child in and out with all these <laughs> so we've now made it you know used to we've we're used to these abnormal families being normalized because transactional Yes. And, you know, and, 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 and inconsequential, really, yeah. you know, that's why a lot of people aren't even getting married. They don't even bother, you know, just having kids out of wedlock and, you know, and just not having that legal commitment or even that, you know, commitment, spiritual commitment between them. So, you know, that paved the way. So that was one aspect, just, you know, the, the relational, the, the contract way that united the families and recognized by the state and by society. What happened with, um, with homosexuality being accepted, I think see I see it along those lines in sexual liberation and sexual expression as being that's more tied into our culture's psychological frame of of having my identity and myself being intrinsically tied to my sexual actions. Um, and that's it also is tied very much into subjectivism, which I talk about a lot about, about the rejection of of absolute truth and objective truth outside of ourselves. And as soon as we all that kind of met and converged together, uh, we now have a restructuring of family, restructuring of marriage, and a restructuring of fundamentally of the identity of human nature and, and human identity and the rights that are tied to that. And that's what should concern everyone. And I want to repeat, that's why your battle against transgenderism <laughs> is over. It was over years ago. <laughs> It was over the at the first instance for you personally. If if you're out there and you're you're one of those culture warriors and you're saying you know down with a transgender, don't you know don't show up at my library, you know mm -hmm. don't be doing any of that. You know your boy's a boy and a girl's a girl. Uh, yet you're over there congratulating Dave Rubin and you're all excited about the homosexual freedom and you're you're embracing the homosexual identity. You need to actually just stop talking about transgenderism because you've already sold the sold the goods you know yes. they're already down on the ship there, there is there is no way that you can you can hold both positions and defend them simultaneously that there, there isn't um and it seems like a lot of people don't realize where this is going and it should be so clear i do think that one of the whenever i cover this topic i always get comments to by some people to the effect of some variation of well there are bad straight relationships too. There are cases where men leave, you must have had the perfect home life, and therefore you're imposing it on everybody else. And so I just want to kind of take a second on that to say no to all of it. Like, um, there are plenty of bad um, straight relationships, if we're going to use that term. I don't think anybody's denying that fact. In fact, you mentioned it earlier with the, the no-fault divorce um, and just how many broken families we have right now. In fact, myself, I grew up in a broken family. My mother and father had me outside of wedlock. My father left before I came back from the hospital. I'm very familiar with broken homes. I don't wish that on other children. And I think that when we're talking about 
bringing children into a family, we have to decide what we're going to lord as decent and good, especially as we're talking in the context of building a culture. Like, seriously, like, the whole point for me in my involvement in politics and conservatism, as we might define it, is about defending that, that Christian culture upon which the West, which we previously called Christendom, was based. That, that's it. I don't care about Republican versus Democrat. I care about what is good and what is decent, and I care about good families, and I care about decent Christian communities, you know, coming together and, and building something that's worth defending, that's worth kind of looking in the mirror at. And I don't think that simply, oh, there's this really bad straight family that existed once, is actually an argument in favor of, you know, gay marriage or abusing a child by denying him his mother or his father in one of these lesbian or gay relationships. Well, it really just comes down to the adage, you know, two wrongs don't make a right. And it's, it's kind of that simple. Oh, so, you know, the straight couple down the street abuses their kids. So therefore, let's abuse some more kids. Right. Let's it's so it broken, to- but it may, it, uh, I'm just always kind of flabbergasted by how often that argument gets made. Like, well, there was this <laughs> abusive home once. And I'm like, well, great. In that case, let's make some more. More broken yeah, homes is what we all need. <laughs> Like, yeah, like, in a different way, not in the same way. Or like, like I'll hear, you know, when I'm talking about, you know, leaving out mothers or leaving out fathers purposely causing emotional harm to children yes. and psychological harm to them, which is proven. I don't even need to make that case. I mean, we have so many studies about the, the, the harm of removing and children being raised without their parents, uh, you know, so, but causing that, purposely causing that neglect yes. and abuse of children, you know, that's okay. Because, you know, it, it, you know, my, I know someone whose mom abused used her and she was her biological mother and she was cruel and I'm like well well there you go (laughs) exactly you have have someone who's an abusive horrible mother so therefore let's just get rid of moms all together let's just eradicate them because you know someone was a bad mom over here we don't need any of them that's the most insane argument it's just stupid it is it's, it's, it makes me want to wear those shirts i see dumb people <laughs> because you know that's you know that's yeah. what you are so that is just a stupid thing to say it's a really lame argument come up with something better yes yes i just had to address it because i know that they'll be in the comments and so i thought i'd go ahead and, and sort of beat them to it um yeah just post i see dumb people yeah there, there you go and so we'll put, we'll put that on the phone i see dead people i think that's what that show that's from but uh, you know it really is something that we need to not you you said about you know, society what do we want our society to be yes you know we talk let me put it in the frame of people who want liberty because that's what we hear you know that's the people we talk to most yes. you know you know if you're a downright communist you don't want liberty i don't even know how to talk to you but most people are always about liberty i want freedom and i want liberty well let me tell you a, a free civil society is built on the foundation of solid families intact biological healthy families that because that creates healthy self-governing intact right-minded individuals who are not like psychologically messed up so um, we're creating more and more messed up people and in and, and a society, and, and we're creating a, a brokenness within the family unit where the state's going to step in. And that's another issue that when you've redefined marriage, and now we've redefined the human being, and now we've redefined parenthood, um, parenthood is now whatever you want it to be and whatever you feel like it can be. And if you obviously have enough money to make it happen, then that is just one step away from the state becoming the parent of children. And um, so if, if children are disconnected legally and, and and relationally and culturally from the organic parents, um, then anyone can step in to make children. Anyone can step in and have authority of children. Because one of the interesting things, when you make yourself the arbiter and when you say that you know man defines truth for himself, yeah. that means any any man can define truth for you. Okay, if you're defining truth for yourself, any man can define truth for you. And so what we've done, that's the abolition of man. That's when, you know, we lose rights. That is the natural, logical trajectory of all of this insanity. It's actually going to lead to more tyranny, more state control, more uh, loss of liberty than what you think. So you think that by supporting all this, that you're supporting freedom and liberty and you're you're going to get a great, raw, raw, wonderful, fun society where everyone's free. No, you're going to get the brave new world. Right. You know, you're going to get where 
the state steps into these voids that have now been made in these family structures that are that keep us. They are the barriers. Yeah. The family parents have always been the barrier between individuals and tyranny. Yes. The church as well, when it's functioning properly, yeah. um, and other institutions, civic institutions within society, but pr- but primarily and most fundamentally the family. That's why in his book, Sex and Culture, and it's Ewan, I can't remember his first name, wrote this massive tome, and it was a study about cult, um, civilizations mm-hmm. and cultures from like 5,000 years ago, it goes back. It's massive. And he, one thing he found, I'll just summarize it, is that as marriage goes, so goes society. Yes. At when when marriage and the family unit in um, in the that connection goes, a society devolves into uncivilized chaos. And it's I, I, just I, said, it is. I agree. And I do think that nowadays part of our problem is that so many people can look around and not really even see a good example of what it's supposed to be and how it's supposed to work. And that it was that way for me growing up. Like I, I just described in brief. Um, the sort of household households that I grew up in. I mean, I, honestly, I just moved around with different um, caregivers. Uh, but in any case, like, I can't think of very many other kids that I had interactions with who had a mother and father who were married and were in a what, what I would nowadays call a healthy family. It just wasn't even normal. It, there weren't good base references. And that's the way that we're going here in America. And this was over in England, of course, where that's even more common than it is here. I think it's where we're going here as well in America. And I think that, I think we need to take some time, like both as individuals and as a society to sort of remind ourselves that there's supposed to be, you know, something really beautiful about a marriage and about this inseparable connection established by God between the, the sort of unifying nature of the marital act committed inside of a marriage and the procreative significance thereof that nowadays we're just kind of losing it's like inside of I mean, i'm trying to keep this family family but inside of this sort of marital act you're supposed to have two people who are exclusive to each other and who through that unite to each other and there's the potential for life uh inside of that and from which each spouse says to the other i'm okay with more of you and in fact i want more of you coming into that into this world and when that happens i want to join with you in raising this child to be you know, what God made them to be. And there's just something incredibly beautiful about that vision. And so few people are even familiar with the concept now because of how broken our society is. Well, that's the one thing sad about normalizing abnormality is that then people don't even, aren't even able to recognize what's true and what's good and what's natural. I mean, we, we entered the land of moral idiot, idiocracy, you know, where, uh, you know, the craziest, most insane things are normalized. And you're like, oh, that's fine, it's, because they don't know any better now. And um, we're be- building a society more and more like that. You know, and you're so right. The, the unity between a man and a woman in the commitment of marriage, where you've made that vow and commitment to each other in love, but before God, who made you and who established that union, now, you know, you are physically and emotionally, and let me emphasize physically, yeah. made to become one. You, be, you unite. That does not and cannot happen in any homosexual relationship. Yes. It, it cannot happen. The parts do not make the one, and they certainly don't make the one of a child. Ask Day Rubin. He had to go on a fertility journey involving three women and another dude. It sounds like a really bad porno, you know, to get, you know, a baby. Yes. And, you know, yeah. it, it's just horrifying. This is not unity. This is not oneness. It's not representative of God's love for us where we're united in, you know, before him and, you know, in spiritual love and commitment and faith. It's not representative of Christ and his church in which we're united to him as one. That oneness is very special and there is no oneness. I'm sorry, guys, I'm not going to mince words about it. There's no oneness, you know, with the two penises. There's no unity there. There's no creation of life yes. and the same with the women. I won't go say the V word because it might shock some of you. But, you know, it's still funny how we're all so puritan in this, you know, yes. really based, sexually based society. But um, there's just not. There's not unity in function and there's not unity spiritually and there's not unity in life. 
it is, as John Paul II said, it's, it's a culture of death, and we need to look at it that way. Yes. And, and you know, the fact that we have technology helping us overcome the hurdles of the culture of death is not an excuse to perpetuate the culture of death. Right, and, and that's the thing, is when, when people tell me that a homosexual relationship is in some way healthy, I have to just ask, how do you define healthy? Because for me, what I look at is a behavior that if everybody were to engage in all at once, we would lead to the extermination of our species because there would be no procreation, right? And it's like, how can you define that as healthy? You can. It is by definition unhealthy if we all were to engage in that particular um, series of actions, we'd simply just wouldn't exist anymore, right? Um, we, we are, are fundamentally rewriting that and saying, that's healthy because because feels right because because it feels like it uh, and we're getting back to where you were before now I do want to talk for just a minute about the fact that since this announcement so many people who proclaim themselves to be conservative most especially um, PragerU the Blaze I believe Glenn Beck um, several uh, commentators at the Blaze which is one of the biggest supposedly conservative uh, uh, Daily Wire you know right all of these different organizations have come out come out, sorry, um, have supported uh, Dave Rubin and his announcement about the purchasing of the children. And I, I was hoping that I wouldn't see it, but I expected it as soon as I saw Dave Rubin's announcement. And I was wondering, do you have anything to say about the way that our, our modern so-called conservatives have been acting on this topic? Yeah, when I say Daily Wire and Federalist, I don't know if they officially have. I know people who work for them have. Uh, you know, so many. Um, well, first I have to just say something because it's funny. When you were talking about the eradication of the species, if this was normative. I did years ago write a children's book called Gary the D Gay Dinosaur. And you can imagine how it went. Yes, <laughs> yes, I can, actually. <laughs> this is fun. But, you know, as far as conservative media, uh, they are more loyal to their friends within conservative media about these issues mm -hmm. than they are to truth. It's just as simple as that because they're afraid of the culture. They'll fight the culture, the cancel culture and all of that on the front of black people and, and critical race theory because they're not they're not really friends with a lot of those. And, and let's face it, that crowd doesn't hold a lot of money that funds the, uh, the conservative movement. Whereas there's a lot of gay people and there's a lot of bisexual people and there's a whole lot of straight Christian people who are misbehaving behind the scenes doing the gay thing. So there's a whole lot of mixture there and, um, and there's a whole lot of money from gay people supporting these institutions. I'm just being honest. There's a whole lot of porn watching going on in conservative circles, which you know corrodes your, your sense of what's right and wrong and, and causes you to compromise and makes you become more and more tolerant of bad behaviors. Uh, you know, this is why, you know, and then they're terrified. They also, it's, it, many of them are millennial age, not all, there's there's not, but it, it, who are very influenced by their peer group. Um, and their peer group is all about accepting homosexuality because it's the loving thing they could do. Now, you can beat up on the transgenders because they're weird and you can, you know, go against the critical race theory, Black Lives Matter, because they're obnoxious or whatever. Um, and they don't really hold that much power in our circles. But do not go against the gay power power because they're in our circles and they're our best buddies and they're hanging at our, at our cocktail parties and they're probably coming into our bedroom sometimes. So this is part of the problem. I, I, do, I do think that it really comes down to power. And when it comes to, have I lost you there? I, okay, I think I lost you for a second. But, interesting. Okay, um, but I, I do think it comes down to a question of power. And when it comes to the gay lobby, they are notoriously powerful, frankly. They have the um, money. It's money. Right. Follow and, the money. And they act like a herd. Um, I would say, I don't know if you've noticed, but you have. Um, but when somebody speaks against the homosexual lobby, there is a level of attack and organization that comes against that person that I, I don't think is mirrored in any other regard. Like, that is the one thing that if you're a conservative, you just, you're not allowed to, to speak about that, you know, like you were saying, like, I can talk about Black Lives Matter a lot easier than I can talk about the homosexual topic. It, it's this topic where there, there are different uh, homosexuals, there are homosexual apologists. This is a topic that, you know, everyone gets uncomfortable about. I get death threats about. Um, and people don't really, I think people who just simply watch the media that I produce don't realize the degree to which there is an organized lobby 
to prevent any criticism of homosexuality and especially to prevent any promotion of something that might be called conversion therapy or reparative therapy or whatever you, you want to talk about uh, and an effort by or to help people who have unwanted homosexual ideations to reform and to to do better to get the therapy that they need to deal with traumas that might have induced it because any a single incident of a person with homosexual ideation then getting the therapy that they need and then no longer having those ideations undermines every argument that we were talking about earlier. It only takes one to go through that and, and thus to, to, to insist by, by nature of his existence, it wasn't the way that I was born. Oh, well, no one's more hated in this world than a uh, ref uh, repentant homosexual. Ask them. I do talk to them. Yes. Uh, I, I have some people on social media that I know I've talked to behind the scenes. And, you know, I have people in my real life that have been formerly gay. And, and no, they weren't bi all, all the time. These were like really 30 years of gay relationships. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to be gay, especially if you're a guy. They were committed. This was who they thought they were. Yeah. So, and you know, it is, um, you know, those people are hated because, if again, if it is your human identity, you can't change it. Yes. And, um, you know, this is why lesbianism really is a joke. And it's a joke to gay men. It's a little secret out there talking to gay men. I think lesbians a joke. Because most lesbians don't hang with lesbianism very long. Yes. They're, they slither slow, slow back and forth and, you know, whatever. Um, you know, it, it's the real force of homosexuality really is among the men and in OCDs tied up in it, traumas tied up in it. You, you, born this way, yeah, I think you might be born this way. It's, it's called a mental illness and it's part of it. It's also called sin. We're all born that way. We all just have our different proclivities and different issues that we have to deal with as far as our sin. You know, um, I have my own sins that I was born that way because of my genetics. You do too. They do too. There are different, you know, but when you have a society that's that's confirming your pathologies, you're born that way, sin, you're born that way, mental illnesses, um, you know, that is a, in calling that your identity, th that's what's disturbing here. You know, the other reason why you talk about the power of the, of the LGBT um, lobby, it is it is money. It is, it is a lot of money. It's a lot of influence. It's, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, homosexuals, unlike... Uh, Black Lives Matter, and, and we still have a bit of a segregated society. I mean, not a lot, but it's voluntarily segregated. I mean, you know, black communities, black right. churches, you know, whereas homosexuality is more integra integrated, you know, homosexual pe people who are have same sex attractions are across all metrics, you know, demographics, and they're, they're in all place, places. So they're more intimately, we know, more intimately tied to who we are in our relationships. But also, um, because it's a sexual identity, and remember that's that's the key here that I want everyone, this is an identity. The sexualization of ourselves as a society and the sexual self that has now given rise to the new modern sense of identity affects all of us. We've all been sexualized, every single one of us. And we've all compared, if we met someone 200 years ago, they would look at us like we're all a bunch of freaks. Right. I'm totally Convinced. Not that I'm idealizing people 200 years ago, but when it comes to sexual identity, they'd be going, what? What is wrong what? with these people? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> why is everything about the sex all the time? And why is that your identity? And it, it's something that's part of how we've developed as a modern society. With all, And there's all kinds of reasons for it. There's books written about it. I don't have time to go into it right now. But um, it is now the sexual self is the, is the modern identity. And that's all of us. And so we don't want to deny now and now that we've also abandoned objective truth mm -hmm. and truth is what you feel most of us are like how can i deny the homosexual his own sense of identity when i've already embraced sexual self and the sexualization of society and the sexualization of girls and the sexual of children and sexualization of everything i mean we sexualize toothpaste and advertise advertisements and we sexualize everything on television we're inundated with sexualization it, it is the very essence now of, of who we are and and so how can we go ahead and, and you know, to deny that of them makes us sound really judgmental and hypocritical and how dare we we've already given up the ghost we've already redefined everything that's why again why we can't go after the transgender they're just their own defining their own sexual identity. They're just doing it on the physical. The homosexuals have changed their, the purpose of their sexual functions, functionality. You know, my parts are to be used in a way that's not according to their design. The transgenders just say, I want to change the parts. But but the, the 
thinking behind it is still based on the same presupposition that I define my own identity. Yeah. I define my own sexual identity. That's the presupposition. That's the presupposition that's in law. That's the presupposition that's going to eradicate the family and have the state come in. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. This is why our culture is in decline. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And now we're, and we're, we're sacrificing our children, as in the Dave Rubin case, as in the, the trans cases that people rightly talk about, but they talk about without foundation anymore. Um, then, well, we've depersoned children from the womb for, for decades now, you know, so we're continuing to deperson them, you know, they, they aren't real people. Right. So I can make all these eggs and sperm transactions and surrogates. And even though I'm holding up pictures of babies, you know, they're not real, you know, I could kill them, you know. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's we, we've depersoned and redefined humanity according to our own wicked schemes and our own pathologies. Right. And we've so, done it for years. So, so what you're saying for somebody who, who doesn't get the sarcasm here um, is, is that with our abortion arguments, our pro-abortion arguments as a society, we have essentially given up the the argument about intrinsic worth and intrinsic dignity of people altogether, right? Because we denied the we denied the intrinsic worth and dignity of those in the womb as people, mm-hmm. even while we, we show off, you know, the, the pictures of, of the baby, right? When we want them, but not when we not when they don't, you know, and that kind of thing. So yeah. We've also, mm-hmm. Yeah, we've also already um, through our acceptance of abortion of abortion, um, eradicated the need of motherhood or the responsibility of motherhood. Yeah. Um, because eggs are are, are, are a vehicle to, of motherhood, you know, and, and sperm is a vehicle of fatherhood. And, and they're they're connected, you know, as go the eggs. That's my motherhood, you know. So when you fertilize and they come together and you become a mother, we have that that's become irrelevant. The motherhood is abandoned. The, the not only do the children not matter, you know, um, the mother the motherhood doesn't matter. Being a mother, the, let me put the responsibilities of being a mother. And certainly the responsibilities of being a father have been abandoned in abortion because fathers aren't even half the time told about it. And and so fatherhood's been abandoned. You know, motherhood has been made irrelevant. And the responsibilities that are intrinsically tied to our procreation of eggs and, and whatever we're doing in the, the creation of children has already been abandoned. Uh, you know, we've redefined marriage. We've redefined the sexual self. We've redefined the human identity. And we've redefined legally the rights that are attached now to that self-made identity. We now have in law that your identity is not from God. Therefore, your rights aren't from God. Your identity is from yourself. So therefore, your rights come from yourself. And if your rights come from yourself, therefore, they can come from someone else who has more power over you. This is this is the trajectory. It's not paranoia. It's not the sky is falling. This is just logic. Yeah, this is where we are. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, Denise, thank you so much for coming on the show today to talk to me. I do appreciate it. And um, you've been one of such a small handful of people who've been willing to talk so honestly about this topic. So I do appreciate you being there. Oh, sure. Well, if someone has to be honest and they're going to persecute you, then, you know, might as well be persecuted for the right thing. <laughs> so That's right. You know, and, and, the, and the motive is good. I, 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 you know, I want what's healthy and you, this is you. You know, I'm, I'm speaking with all adjusting aside, which I do, you know, and sarcastically leading people to their own <laughs> logical conclusions. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, it is as one of love for children, love for our society, love for people. I want people to be in, to ha- be healthy selves. I want you to be the self that God designed you to be and not the sexualized imposition of feelings that you're putting on yourself and on your on other people and on children. Uh, but, but who God is, because we are only truly happy when we're living according to God's design of things, according to his created order, without living according to God's created order, because you didn't create yourself. You know, you didn't make those eggs and you didn't make your sperm and you didn't make your body. God did. You know, God designed that. He's the great architect. When you when you say when you give him the the flippy and you don't want to have anything to do with what he has to say, uh, and you want to define it yourself, then you're just opening yourself to be defined by anybody, and you're a, you will become a slave to anyone who has power over you because they can define the very essence of your humanity for you. And we're doing that for children. We're defining for children who they are. We're not letting them be defined by God. You know, we're not we're not looking them as spiritual creatures that we're responsible for. Mm-hmm. We're not letting them look at um, human beings who, who, who grow into their sexual selves, you know, who grow into their self- sexual relationships. I don't even like sexual selves, but grow into their manhood and womanhood is what right. I mean. Um, we're, we're imposing sexual identity on them because we're saying their feelings are what make that, you know, we're, we're sexualizing them and opening up the door to all kinds, all for adults 
to get their own sick satisfaction and suck the life out of children to fill up the empty places in their own lives. You know, I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm looking at that and that's horrifying to me. And, and I want to help people. Yes. I want to help people not be that way. I want D- Dave Rubin to find a really good woman and have a healthy, happy baby with her. I mean, that's what I want. That's what I want and have a happy family life, you know, and, and not use his money and his power to abuse children. And uh, Sorry, and, and, very, you know, and to exploit and to exploit women at the same time, as in the case of surrogacy. Um, okay, Denise McAllister, you're the author of What Men Want to Say to Women But Can't, and you're currently, if I'm not mistaken, writing at beltoftruthmagazine.com. Is there anywhere else that people should find you? No, just that. And Belt of Truth is just Christian teaching, practical theology. Um, I'm not doing cultural commentary and political commentary, except when I'm invited on wonderful shows like, like those. Glad to have you. Uh, so, um, it's great to be here, but thank you for that. All yes. right, thank you. All right, bye-bye.